All right, so I talked about how mathematics and maths in general can be thought of as this idea of toys and rules. One of the things that math does, and, and conceptually what we're talking about, is this idea of modeling. We go through and see things in, in reality, and we try to then prepare or think about it for a while. Uh, you know, easy examples when we start to do problems like, you know what, I wonder what number when I take away three would end up being a five. You have, you know, that might be a kind of a game problem and say working through the solution and trying to get to say, ah, I bet eight minus three is five and you could check it. Most of the stuff what we do is as we interact with reality and with things that actually are, we start to notice patterns and abstractions and try to get things that are useful to us. So if I want to find out, you know, modeling and say, okay, when would it be best to plant crops? Um, how much do I have? Uh, you could go through things as simple as if John bought five objects and Jane bought two objects and it cost seven dollars and then some other people bought the same sorts of objects in different quantities and it comes a different amount. Can you figure out what costs are? Those sorts of problems as you interact can be modeled and part of the idea of mathematics is to figure out you know what your toys are and how the modeling and the rules work. And whether it's the idea of for calculus being functions and the rules being things like composition and addition and well and for in terms of toys what is a function and defining what it is and how would you add functions and multiply functions and integrate functions and differentiate functions. For discrete, one of the things that we're going to talk about in the beginning is this idea of propositional logic. Now propositional logic and what's interesting about discrete is for the first semester we'll start off with the study of a particular form of human language and that will be become what logic is and then we'll end up at the end of the second semester going back and talking about human language again and how that becomes uh, machines themselves or Turing machines. But for now since we're talking about modeling things that are the toys that we'll work with under propositional logic is going to be uh, English sentences of a particular type and what we're going to talk about is the idea of things that are true uh, versus things that are false. Basically a truth or a lie. And how can I model or understand, well in a sense it's modeling, you know, this idea of a truth or a lie being things that are. An easy example would be, uh, let's say this is class, I say if you do all of your homework and you get A's and you do all of the exams and you get A's and you take the final exam and you get an A, then I'm going to give you an A for the course. If you did all those things, and then I failed you for the course, you would immediately know right away that there's a word for me and that's a liar. So given that I've had this English sentences that I said and the after effects of this, you would know at a fundamental nature there is such a thing as a truth and there is such a thing as a lie. Can I model things that are true and can I model things that are, are false? this idea of using these ideas of toys and to say alright if these are, if a truth is and a false is and we know them, you can't define them, we just know what they are and we know that they exist then how can we go about doing it and so normally this is another approach is now that we have something to discuss things that are true and things that are false what are they? you know what are these toys and so we start off in the idea of what's a proposition. A proposition is going to be something that can be either true or false, but not both. So if I'm going to deal with truths and false, so I said things like, you know, if you get A's, then I give you an A, but you got your A's and I failed you, and you say, you're a liar on this. We can tear that, well, what I said apart and start to ask, well, what is it? So a proposition itself is going to be something that is either true or false and exclusively so because I look at it yes that is true and it's only true yes that is false and it's only false and it's going to be a sentence and it's going to be a sentence but there's lots there's questions there's opinions those are not true 
and strictly true and false and strictly false. Things that are true or strictly true when you say it are things like, uh, my name is Mark, right? When I look at this, I would say, you know, that's either true or that is false. And I notice about this particular sentence is it declares something. So it's a declarative sentence. that is true or false, uh, but now we actually have a problem with the word or. <laughs> In the English word or, there's actually two ors. <laughs> uh, we use the word or when we say things like, uh, would you like soup or salad, or would you like a fork or a spoon? Uh, the first or is called an exclusive or, right? If it's, it's either soup or salad, you don't get both. And that's what we're talking about here. It's a sentence that is either true and only true or false and only false. So it's the exclusive or. Uh, if you have a question about which or you're talking about, you normally would then just simply add but not both. And you might ask, it's like, you know, uh, how is my name is Mark? That's a declarative sentence that is true or false but not both. Uh, what do you mean but not both? What does, Doesn't that actually make sense? And so we have some examples here that might actually end up into... Uh, problematic features and so one example would be again uh, the say the sky is blue my name is Mark um, cats eat mice so here's some examples that we have it and one of the things we could ask as I start to look at this and I could say you know what for all of these propositions right there's kind of a feature of this declarative sentence that is true or false but not both. For all of these propositions, I notice that I tend to have an object, the thing that I'm talking about, like my name is Mark, would be the object, would be the person talking, right? And it has a feature that you're testing that is normally called the predicate. So my name is Mark, the name being Mark would be the feature of, that would make it true or false, and that would be the predicate. The sky is blue. Well, blueness is the predicate, right? That's going to make it true or false. The object is the sky. Cats eat mice. Well, what's the predicate? Eating mice is the predicate. Cats are the object as we go through it. So, you know, for these particular things, we would have that things that are not propositions. So, non propositions would be things like questions or opinions. So uh, for those particular problems, whether it's a question, whether it's an opinion, you know, opinion would be something like the lines of, it might sound like a proposition, like Mark Aerosmith is the best teacher ever. Well, that's just an opinion, right? Because you couldn't actually declare that to be obvious, that's true, or it's either strictly true or it's strictly false. It's like, well, it's just an opinion. You can't say it's true or, or false. Uh, um, the other thing on, oh, I'm missing an I there. Do, 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 pen, yes. So there's also the question of, well, is it both true, false? And so this would be one that'd be kind of weird, but a good example would be uh, the following statement. Uh, this sentence is false. Well, that's a sentence. It declares something. What's the object? It's the sentence itself, so it's recursive in nature, but that's the object. What's the predicate? It being false. So if the sentence is false, I could test it. Oh, look, it's false. But that would mean that the sentence is false evaluates to actually true. <laughs> so if it's false, it's true. All right, well, fine. Well, what if it's true? Well, the sentence is false evaluates to true. That means that the sentence itself must have been false because that's what you're testing. So if it's true, it's false, and if it's false, it's true, so it's actually both at the same time, and all right, fine, it's not a proposition. Um, it really gets down to the idea that anything that is not strictly true or strictly false, if there's any confusion, this idea of being both true and false at the same time, questions, opinions, um, those particular things would make them not propositions, and we do what you typically do in mathematics, uh, which is, hey, this is hard to work with, Okay, fine. Ignore it. We are not going to work with these sorts of objects. 
So for this problem, uh, anything that's a not a proposition, we're going to toss it. And now we are only going to work with, this is kind of interesting that, what's our toys? Our toys are English sentences. Well, not necessarily English. I mean, if you know another language, it's just a declarative sentence that is true or false, but not both. So we're dealing with words. We're not dealing with numbers. We're not dealing with other things. We're dealing with a discussion. So now that we have our toys are done, we can move on to the idea of since their toys are equal to these propositions, on to the rules. Now one rule that we normally deal with right away for most mathematics is the idea of sameness. When are two things the same? Uh, that's actually going to be a little bit hard to do right now, so we're going to have to hold off on what it means to be same. And so rather what we're going to do is move on eventually to this idea of how do these things in particular go together. So we could go on to the rules and ask for what are operations on propositions. And we'll deal with those operations. But before I talk about the operations on propositions, uh, if we're going to deal with operations, we're going to have to work with a little bit of notation. So first. All right. Uh, one of the things that happens is the idea of a variable. What is a variable? And we have things like in college algebra, you would do things like You would see things like, you know, 3x plus 2, <laughs> plus 2, plus 1 is equal to, I don't know, 7. You know, things of this nature. And we would have all these particular symbols that go along with college algebra. Well, we're going to have something similar with propositional logic. So we have all of these. Uh, we're going to learn symbols for the objects. And we are going to learn the idea of the symbols for the operations and what the operations actually do. So the, what we'll talk about here first is the symbols for the objects. Now, the objects themselves we can have, you know, in college algebra, we have symbols like seven, which represents a quantity of the number seven and ones, and plus is a symbol for an operation. But this little x here that we talk about is this idea of a variable. A variable is really just simply it's one of the toys, it's an object that we don't state what it is exactly, right? So for example, this x, this is a number, right? I'm just not going to tell you what it is right now. Now, I can plug numbers in there and it makes this particular quality false. It makes that particular quality true if I plug in other numbers as I do it. But in the end, it's simply a number. I just don't know what it is or I'm not stating what it is. It's just holding the place of a number of a certain sort. So all the things that you do with numbers are all the things that you would do with that. So a propositional variable Say, for example, say P is going to be, well, this is a declarative sentence, right? If there's a whole sentence, where I see that P, it holds a whole sentence. Well, what is that sentence? I'm not going to say. I don't know, don't really care, but in that P, that symbol itself holds a sentence. Just like, for example, in college algebra, what's in that x? It's a number. What number is it? That's an interesting question. I don't care. I'm not going to tell you. Maybe I want you to find it. But on the other hand, it's a number. We just don't have it. Uh, or not. we're not stating it. The same thing. If I have a p, what is a p? It's a declarative sentence. Um, man, I put the a before the l. Do, do, do. Right, declarative. And it's just holding its place. Now, what's interesting about 
this declarative sentence that's holding its place is the difference between that and say for example back to algebra. In algebra if I have x is a real number we could visualize this by just simply writing the real number line and so x is somewhere here right and so the real number line in its entirety is all the infinite number of values that x could take on x could be zero, it could be a positive, it could be negative, anywhere from minus infinity to infinity alright but for propositional logic what's interesting about p is a proposition how would I visualize that? Well what's awesome about propositions is yes there are an infinite number of declarative sentences my name is Mark, I am Mark is sitting down, the sky is blue infinite number of things that I could ever possibly do but all of them all propositions are going to be true or false <laughs> and that's it there's only two outcomes it doesn't matter what you say my name is Mark if I say it it's true if John says my name is Mark that's false it doesn't matter what the proposition is the propositions are going to be split up into true and false and so that means that if I want to instead of a real number not line I can form what's called a truth table and so a truth table simply is let's handle all of them kind of similar to a, a number line and say hey look what's P well, it's true or it's false that's it so that's a truth table of one variable now as I get to more variables and like when we do like Cartesian lines I can what if I have both Y's and X's we write two number lines that cross each other and we have the Cartesian plane uh, on the other hand what if I have say two variables If I have two propositional variables, say P and Q, well, P is true or false, or Q is true or false, but for them together, well, they both could be true. The first could have been the true, and the second could have been a lie. The first could have been a lie, the second could have been a true, or they both could have been lies. So there's four outcomes for two variables. Well, what about three? What if it was P, Q, and R? Well, there's going to be eight outcomes. It could be true, 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 true false, 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 true, true, false, false, true, true, false, false, true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false, and that would be my truth table. I have eight outcomes. Now, when we make truth tables in this class, I do know other, if you read other books, they might put it in the order of falses first before trues, and some books will use ones and zeros, one representing true and zero representing false. Uh, please do not do that. From this point on, as we move up, if we would go through the pattern, we would have 16 possibilities for four variables, and you would, I would like to see all of the patterns match these tables as we move on. So, we have our new toys. They are declarative sentences that are strictly true or strictly false but not both we can represent them visually with truth tables no matter what they are you know it doesn't matter what you say if you say three declarative sentences you're either gonna tell the truth three times you're gonna lie three times or some combination thereof there are eight possibilities that can happen no matter what you say it's gonna be one of those eight rows if you have two things it's gonna be one of those four rows if you say one thing it's one of those two rows right and so now we have the ability to work with our toys. So the next part that I'll be talking about here will be how do I deal with the operations of these compound propositions.